Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It's a little bit more encouraging. Health leaders deliver the actual stats on state vaccinations. I see it as um, a, a trailblazing opportunity. A wife carrying on her husband's legacy. We see a consistent decline. Making changes to make sure kids learn to read. Hello everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top headlines in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, the latest coronavirus numbers across the state. The numbers have begun to plateau, but they aren't dropping as quickly as officials would like. As of this afternoon, the Department of Health is reporting almost 2,400 new cases and 58 new deaths. That brings the total number of cases up to nearly 400,000. Even as our numbers have started to slowly improve in these other categories, the number of deaths really uh, have not. Uh, and it is a staggering number of deaths that, that have accumulated uh, over the course of the pandemic. And the numbers that we're announcing on a daily basis literally do uh, take my breath away. And now a check on other headlines making news across the state. The Army Corps of Engineers will spend another $46 million in the next fiscal year to finish the deepening of the Mississippi River. By dredging to 50 feet from Baton Rouge to the mouth of the river, next generation new Panamax ships can travel as far north as the capital city. The project total of $240 million is expected to bring in an average of $128 million more million a year to the national economy. Another blow to New Orleans tourism from Carnival Cruise Lines. Valor, one of its two ships that home port in the Crescent City, will delay sailing until at least the end of October. Carnival says the delays reflect the latest expectations with the coronavirus pandemic and vaccinations. Louisiana is again looking into replacing decades-old voting machines. Secretary of State Kyle Ardoin is soliciting new bidders and expects great interest and scrutiny in his search for a new contractor, much of it because of the national debate over the presidential election and baseless allegations of widespread voter fraud by former President Donald Trump and his supporters. Governor Edwards is asking President Joe Biden for $3 billion to help the state in its ongoing recovery from the 2020 hurricanes. The governor talked about the assistance during a stop in hard-hit Lake Charles to discuss recovery work from Hurricanes Laura and Delta. Meantime, insurance companies have paid out $5 billion to thousands of state customers with hurricane damage from last year. The data from Insurance Commissioner Jim Donilon is the first detailed look at claims. Policyholders have filed nearly 291,000 claims for damage. The Louisiana Capitol building cost $5 million to complete nearly 90 years ago, but needs about $75 million now for repairs to keep the historic high-rise safely in use for years to come. The biggest repair cost involves mortar work and maintenance on some of the upper tower floors. Lawmakers still need to sign off on the money needed for those repairs. A cubicle satellite small enough to fit in the palm of your hand is zipping around the world and sending data about radiation to the Louisiana students who built it. The CAPE-3 carries a chip designed and built by students at UL Lafayette. A focus of the mini sat is to detect radiation and keep astronauts safe. State athletic leaders are shutting down high school wrestling until the state meet at the end of February. They made the move after a reported COVID outbreak connected to the Louisiana Classic meet two weeks ago in Gonzales. Pausing the sport means no traditional tournaments that normally lead up to state. Six weeks after a roof collapse killed two workers at the Cargill salt mine on Avery Island, Cargill has shut down the mine and will not resume operations. They had planned to stop production by the end of this year. 
A federal investigation of the incident continues, and inspectors have uncovered at least four serious safety violations. The company will now work to safely shutter the mine. It's uncertain what the future holds for the 200 employees, but Cargill says it will take about three years to decommission it. Cargill has produced salt for 24 years on that island, and the mine has been in operation there since the mid-1800s. It was the first rock salt mine in North America. President Joe Biden's temporary halt to drilling on federal lands leaves the vast majority of the U.S. crude production untouched, but Louisiana industry advocates say that is not the case for the Gulf of Mexico. Drilling in the Gulf has been ravaged by low prices and low demand during the COVID pandemic. I spoke with David Dismukes of the LSU Center for Energy Studies. He says in the short term, the ramifications may be limited, but their implications for the state's recovery out of the pandemic downturn and for future growth and jobs are considerable. On next week's edition of SWI, we'll talk with Dismukes and other industry analysts. That's next Friday at 7 here on LPB. Louisiana's ranking of vaccines administered has moved from 13th to 16th this week. The stats tell us that's about 60% of shots in arms. I asked Dr. Joseph Cantor, why so low? And he says one reason is that it accounts for a second shot not yet taken. We discussed the variant strains emerging, vaccinations, and looked at timetables. If you just look at the first doses and take out the long-term care partnership, we're actually around 90% or so. Um, using what's made available. And that feels more realistic because, um, you know, that also accounts for dosages that get shipped like that day and might arrive at a pharmacy or clinic that morning. We're not going to use them all, you know, that evening. And there's a couple of day lag from getting these things entered into the system. So when you look at it that way, it's a little bit more encouraging. There's a one dose treatment that is getting closer to approval or where does that stand? Closer, baby steps. Uh, so it's it's the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine candidate. It's still completing trials right now. Okay. So we don't have data yet. We expect they're going to apply for authorization from the FDA within the coming weeks, um, two weeks, three weeks, something like that is a reasonable expectation. And then as long as the trial data looks good at that point we can expect them to operationalize that pretty quickly. It's a very exciting development because it's a single dose vaccine, one dose and you're done. Is the efficacy uh, the same about? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't know that, we, I mean, the company has said it is, but until we see the data from the trial, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna be our own judges of this. So we don't know, we haven't seen the trial. Um, normally the way the FDA has been doing this is, the FDA will publish publicly all the documents that they look at to render a decision on authorization. It's actually, they don't always do that. They've done it for these two vaccines because there's such, um, it's so important to make the public feel that everything's being transparent. And, and I agree with that. So they actually bended their rules and made all this information public, which they don't always do. The other thing that the pharmaceutical manufacturers are doing is they're looking at these new variants, uh, the UK variant and the South African variant to make sure that it's a good match. And if other variants come up down the road that are not a good match, particularly with these mRNA vaccines, these new technology, they'll be able to change and adjust the vaccine fairly quickly. And presumably that's something that would work for a booster shot. And that's, that's kind of how flu vaccine works every year. It's a new technology for vaccines, but it's not a new technology for medicine. And we've been using mRNA platforms for cancer therapeutics for a number of years. That's one of the things these were built on. And I'll tell you, it, it is just miraculous that we, we're barely 12 months in from even knowing this virus existed. And, and not only do we have a vaccine identified in the lab somewhere, I mean, we are giving it out to people, you know, a significant number of people. That's miraculous. It didn't come out of thin air. There were a, a couple of key things that enabled this. Number one, after the SARS epidemic, which also was a coronavirus, there was a lot of investment made in producing a vaccine for a coronavirus. And that led directly to the vaccines we have now. So they had that platform in place because of wise investments made back then. The other thing that the feds did good, and you gotta give credit where credit is due, this was a good call. 
by, by the federal administration is they placed a bet on these vaccines and they paid the companies to start producing them at scale while the trials were still ongoing, knowing that if the trials ended up to show they were bad or unsafe or not efficacious, they would lose that investment, just money. But if it turned out to be good, which they did, they had such a head start on, on production. That paid off, that paid off big time. As you sit today, are you feeling more confident, more comfortable with where things are, with where the virus is as it uh, has spread, but maybe began to plateau a bit? You know, I have mixed emotions about it. I'm, I'm very um, encouraged by the vaccine work. And, and while it is slow, I'm encouraged that Louisiana is doing the right things and we'll be able to make the best effect of supply once it increases. Uh, we have peaked and have started to come down on the other side of it from our Christmas and New Year's spike. But um, I do know that the variant, the, the UK variant, the B117 variant is taking hold in Louisiana. We've formally identified one case of it, but when you've identified one, you know you have a whole lot other ones that you just haven't identified yet. So that's gonna continue to spread. Um, the CDC thinks it could become the dominant strain in the US by March. Um, we know it's more transmissible. There now is some suggestion that it also might be more virulent. And that's a new development. We didn't think it was a couple of weeks ago, but some data came out from the UK that shows it might be. Thankfully, we still believe that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are good matches. And that's important. But, but I think we have another spike ahead of us as that variant continues to spread in Louisiana. I guess people who've had it, would they be less needing to get the vaccine quicker than others? You know, it's an interesting question. So what the CDC says is if you in your acute illness phase, so like if you have it right now and you're within the 10 days, don't get the vaccine. You know, wait until at least until you're over that period, that, that immediate period. Beyond that, for people that had it maybe a few weeks ago and have recovered, the CDC says you certainly can get it. It's safe to do so, it's efficacious to do so but you probably have some innate protection that lasts at least 90 days. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna delay until 90 days, because you're probably less at risk than somebody else, you're somewhat encouraged to do so, although not required to do so. The wife of late Congressman-elect Luke Letlow filed her paperwork qualifying for the 5th District Congressional seat. Julia Letlow says running in her husband's place is the best way to carry on his legacy. She says everything she's ever done has led up to this moment. Julia Letlow never imagined she'd be here, running in a race she and her husband had planned out for years. In her opinion, Luke Letlow was born to be a leader. The 5th Congressional seat had his name written on it. Luke was uh, a true servant at heart. He, he cared about building relationships with people. He actually spent 20 years of his life cultivating relationships with people all over the state and all over the country, quite frankly. Um, he was, that was his gift. And uh, it didn't matter um, if you were the CEO or the custodian, he was going to find a commonality with you. He may even find out how you were related um, because he was into genealogy and ancestry. He used his prior experience working as current 5th District Congressman, Ralph Abraham's chief of staff, as a way to move into the political world. Luke's a great dad, and he's also very concerned about our kids having a future here in Louisiana. He took his wife and kids throughout Louisiana to meet with people and share his policy. His wife was there every step of the way, absorbing everything around her. Luke Letlow for Congress. We uh, visited all 24 parishes together. We took our kids. We had an amazing time listening to people from all over the district, as he would say, from Bastrop to Bunky to Bogalusa and all points in between. Um, and just hearing their heart and their vision and their concerns for their children and future generations. It was such an honor uh, to be along for the ride and, and to help in, in a small way. But wow, I mean, what an experience. And I know the kids and I will uh, take those memories with us. Those experiences are all memories now. Luke would go on to take that fifth congressional seat and succeed his mentor, Ralph Abraham. But the victory was short lived. Not long after he won the election, Luke started to feel sick. We were actually about to fly to Washington, D.C. to start the process um, of uh, transitioning 
him into that role. Um, and he was doing a um, radio interview similar to what we're doing. Uh, he was in the living room and he said, you know, Julie, I feel like I'm running a temperature. And so um, I checked his temperature and he was. And, and so that's when he he went to be tested because we didn't want to travel if if either of us, um, you know, had COVID. And so that's that's when he knew. His symptoms got worse over the next couple of days. He died on December 29th from complications related to COVID-19. The house will be in order. He was never sworn into office. We mourn the death of the first member of Congress, Luke Letlow, newly elected and not yet sworn in. He was honored at the United States Capitol on New Year's Eve. His death brings the brutal nature of this coronavirus plague to the doorstep of Congress. We just thought, like um, everyone else may um, take for granted, that you'll you'll get through it, and it, it may be rough for a little while, but... You know, I was I was playing nurse and taking good care of him, and he was uh, seeing his doctors. And um, so, yeah, that was that was a rough time, but we were making it work. Letlow grieved for her husband, but in the midst of it all, she had a quick decision to make. The fifth congressional seat was still vacant. Then she had a thought: Who better to take on her late husband's job than her? The person that stood beside him helped him develop his ideas and campaigned with him. Luke and I have been best friends and partners for the last eight years, as you often are with your spouse, your lockstep, uh, whereas my career and trajectory lended itself towards higher education, which um, in itself is a, is a form of service, I believe. Um, his was in government, and so they married well together, even our professional lives, and we would come home at night and discuss everything that had happened that day. Letlow says everything in her life prepared her for this moment. She'd seen firsthand all of the happenings in Congress from working with her husband. She officially threw her name in the hat not even a month after her husband's death. I want to share with you that this morning I qualified as a candidate to work for the privilege of serving this same district. She says she'll hold on to the same policies and Christian values her husband campaigned on, agricultural expansion, and creating rural jobs. Her only add-on is education, a cause that's dear to her heart. This race means a lot to Letlow. It's not only a way to continue Luke's legacy, but a chance to show that women and mothers can make a change even when the odds are stacked up against them. Luke, I think he would be thrilled. I can just see him cheering me on. Um, I think he would probably be chuckling to himself saying, I told you so, you know, <laughs> um, I knew you could do this. And um, so I just feel that that complete peace and comfort. Letlow will try her luck against a dozen opponents, including Republican Alan Guillory and newly qualified Democrat Sandra Kristoff. A new report shows reading scores for the state's youngest students is on the decline for three consecutive years now. It's a big problem that needs immediate attention. I talked with Council for Better Louisiana's Barry Irwin and State Superintendent Kate Brumley. I am alarmed. You know, I'm a native Louisianian and uh, just want to make sure that, that our kids and our families and, and our state uh, get uh, everything that's needed. And whenever we look at reading levels and we look at them over the last three years, we, we see a consistent decline. Now, this year, understandably, we're in a global health pandemic. You can understand a decline, uh, but the pattern is concerning. Right. And so we just have to give more attention uh, as a state, not just to early child, childhood education, uh, birth to four, but also in, in K-3 to make sure that, that we are teaching those foundational skills that kids need to be successful. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that our, our universities uh, are on the right track uh, with providing uh, the instruction that pre-service teachers need. We need to make sure our teachers in our classrooms have the resources that they need. We need to make sure they have the professional development they need. And, and frankly, the time to be able to give instruction in things like phonemic awareness uh, and phonics. So, you know, I've said for the last couple of weeks, you know, we, we look forward to leading a reading revival across the state uh, and flipping this trajectory. And, and I think we can. And, um, you know, it's going to take everybody's support, but it's just so, so important. I'm an optimist, and, and I believe that if you apply strategy, you apply the human capital, you apply the resource, you, you can change the outcomes. 
And so we look forward to, to working with as many people as possible across the state to, to really lean in in this area. Um, you know, if a kid can't read on grade level by the end of third grade, it becomes much more difficult to get them on level. And, and frankly, they're two, three, four times more likely to drop out of high school. And so we, we have to attack this early on. Um, and so we are working through that. We're, you know, we're, as an administration, we're releasing a priorities plan uh, this week uh, and, and are also working on a very detailed strategic plan uh, for literacy, uh, a statewide literacy plan that will, will be released this spring. Let me ask you, we always talk about early childhood education. That's the core, the key, but that seems to be the area where we're not getting the job done. Well, I, I have consistently said early, early childhood education, birth to four is the greatest educational challenge of our generation. You know, 90% of our kids in some of our communities come to school not kindergarten ready. Our average across the state, half of our kids come to kindergarten without those basic skills to be successful on day one in kindergarten. And so schools then go into catch up mode. And so if, if we had more investment into high quality um, early child care centers across the state. I mean, I, I think that that is transformational for our local communities and our region and our state as a whole. What are you finding seven months into the job that maybe you didn't expect to find or is it going exactly the way you expected? <laughs> well, the pandemic. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm seven months in the job and it, it feels like seven years. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm consistently inspired uh, by what I see uh, with teachers and leaders and kids and families and uh, know that we will be post pandemic. Um, and so we're, we're trying to put in place uh, the plans and the ideas uh, so that so that we're in a better position post pandemic to do better for the state. You know, I've seen I've seen for many years, my entire life, Louisiana ranked 49th, 48th and um, you know, that's just not good enough. And, and I want to be part of the solution. And, you know, I, I honestly and candidly think that we can. And uh, I want to be part of helping to make that happen. We have a vacuum in our current accountability model where we, we measure outcomes in our early child care centers, birth to four. We begin measuring outcomes in third grade for kids, but, but we don't really look at that uh, kindergarten uh, through second grade area. And so, you know, we have to have some level of accountability there, but we also have to make sure that we give the training and support. Uh, and resource that's needed uh, for them to be successful. So, you know, it's a it's a multifaceted approach that we have to implement, uh, but I think it can only help us get better. If you talk about things we can do, I think you don't really have to look much further than Mississippi. Just a very few years ago, they were in the same boat we are, the very bottom, you know, of the country. But they had a governor and they had people in higher education that decided that they were going to focus very strongly on early literacy. And they came up basically that the, the idea was, was trying to teach teachers how to teach reading in a different way. And that's exactly what they've done. They don't change the way reading is, you know, the reading is reading, but they teach teachers how to teach it in a different way. And it's called the science of reading. It's, it's a, a different approach. But what's happened is in a very short time, Mississippi has jumped way above a lot of states, including us. When we were tied with them about 48th and whatever on the the national scores just a few years ago, they are at the national reading level for third grade right now. And a lot of states, including Louisiana, are taking a look at what they did. And uh, I think we're already seeing, you know, some very beginnings of that here in the state. I think you'll see that accelerate. Do you set a two-year plan or three-year plan or some sort of agenda to, okay, we've got to reach this goal to be better, to be better, to be better when you see something like this? Yeah. So, so we're calling out focus areas of our administration this week, key priorities, but also behind every one of those focus areas, we're going to be developing a work plan, you know, of what has to happen, who has to make that happen, when does that need to happen, how are we going to check to make sure that's happening, you know, and, and those are the operational things that it takes, logistical things that it takes in order to, to move an organization or move, move outcomes. And so that's, that's what we're going to do. Some, some may say it's a, it's a corporate approach. I don't know. I, I just think it's doing what makes sense, calling out the things that you want to do, building a plan to do them, and then holding everyone accountable, uh, along with myself, to get those things done. 
This week, Cable Council for a Better Louisiana presented LPB President and CEO Beth Courtney with its fifth Robert B. Ham Award for Distinguished Public Service. Beth took the helm at LPB in 1985. She was here before that, though, becoming one of the first women in the country to assume a prominent leadership role in the broadcast industry. Beth, congratulations to you. According to the 2020 State of Obesity Report, America's obesity rate is 42.4 percent. It's the first time it's topped 40 percent. Louisiana ranks number nine in the nation for adult obesity at 36 percent. This month, Louisiana Public Square offers advice on shedding pounds and examines the effectiveness of different diets and weight loss surgeries. I think one of the greatest indications and one of the best indications for weight loss surgery is diabetes. Right. So diabetes, not only are we getting a person to lose weight, so things like high blood pressure mm -hmm. and sleep apnea tend to go away as well, Correct. makes the overall health of the patient better, but there's an intrinsic process within the operation that starts the reversal process of diabetes. Healthy New Year re-airs this Sunday at 11 a.m. You can determine what category your weight falls into by taking our confidential online survey. Visit lpb.org slash public square for details. LPB and the Baton Rouge Area Foundation held a virtual ceremony for the Ernest Gaines Award for Literary Excellence Thursday night. Chicago native Gabriel Bump's debut book, Everywhere You Don't Belong, was named the winner of the 2020 Gaines Award. The award honors Louisiana's revered storyteller, Ernest J. Gaines, and serves to inspire and recognize rising African-American fiction writers of excellence at a national level. Now, during the virtual event, Bump was there to accept the award. If you missed the premiere and want to stream the award presentation, you can do so at lpb.org slash YouTube. While COVID-19 claimed the life of a true friend of LPB and a leader of Baton Rouge and the state. Former state representative and mayoral candidate Steve Carter passed away after a three week battle with the virus. He went into the hospital and never left. Steve had a remarkable life. He was captain of the LSU tennis team, later head coach there for four years, won an SEC championship, and he was two-time SEC coach of the year. And then it was politics. Steve loved Baton Rouge. He was a personal friend. Our prayers for his wife, Gloria, and their family. Steve Carter was 77. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.